It isn't a stretch to say that Colonel Jack O'Neill is synonymous with Stargate. Along with Daniel Jackson, Jack was a holdover from the 1994 feature film. Played by actor Richard Dean Anderson, he was the man who led the SG-1 team through the gate on new adventures each week. But what's a long-running show like Stargate to do when its leading man chooses to reduce his role after many years of hard work? Even before RDA finally retired after eight seasons, the writer's room needed to do some creative thinking to adapt to his reduced time on set. Stargate filmed in Vancouver, British Columbia, while the actor spent his weekends at home in California. After the show moved to Sci-Fi Channel with season six, it found a new lease on life, but Anderson wanted to prioritize spending more time at home with his young daughter. So for season six and seven, he agreed to continue on, but with an increasingly reduced shooting schedule that had him in Vancouver for fewer days each week. That continued on into season eight when Anderson's time was reduced even further. As a result, the show's writers spent these three years thinking up clever ways to keep Jack O'Neill as the star of the show, while also sidelining the character for numerous stories. It was done so well that if you aren't looking for it, you might not have noticed them all. But once you realize what was going on behind the scenes, well, the actor's absence for some or all of an episode starts to get conspicuous. Number 12, Skewered, Season 2, Episode 13. Before we get to RDA's reduced schedule starting in Season 6, it's worth noting one prominent episode that saw Colonel O'Neill sidelined early in SG-1's run. It's the Season 2 episode, Spirits, which gave Captain Samantha Carter her first chance to command the team off-world after the Colonel was injured at the start of the episode. The Salish fire a tritium dart through the Stargate penetrating the glass window of the SGC control room and skewering Jack's arm. This was the writer's creative solution for Anderson's paternity leave. The birth of his daughter Wiley had him away from set for several days. The episode's shooting schedule was arranged to keep Jack in the second half when the Salish spirits are running around Stargate Command. But because of Jack's injury, he never goes off-world, freeing up the actor from this episode's days shooting on location. Number 11. Jack Falls Deathly Ill, Season 6, Episodes 4 and 5. In the episode Frozen, the discovery of an ancient woman beneath the surface of Antarctica exposes SG-1 to a deadly illness, probably the same plague that nearly wiped out the ancients millions of years ago. Although Ayana manages to heal the rest of the team and the scientists at the research outpost before she dies, Jack is not so lucky. He reluctantly agrees to take on a Tok'ra symbiote in order to save his life which explains why Jack is entirely absent from the next episode, Nightwalkers. This is the first episode in which Jack O'Neill doesn't appear at all. But he comes back in a big way. Anderson returned to set to film Abyss, in which O'Neill is imprisoned and tortured by Ball. It's one of the character's best episodes ever. Number 10, Accused of Murder. Season 6, Episode 14. Jack is at the center of the plot for Season 6's Smoke and Mirrors, but because he's arrested on suspicion of murder, Anderson is barely in the episode at all. The colonel is arrested at the beginning of the first act, and authorities have hard evidence implicating him in the assassination of Senator Kinsey. The rest of his team set out to clear Jack's name, and the episode follows them while Jack cools his heels in jail. The team exposes a rogue NID agent and a cabal of businessmen known as the Committee as the ones behind the assassination attempt, and Colonel O'Neill's good name is cleared. Jack returns at the end of the episode for a reluctant photo op with the still-living Senator. Number 9. Mini Jack? Season 7, Episode 3. Maybe the most brilliant example of writing out Richard Dean Anderson, but still focusing the story on Jack O'Neill, is the Season 7 episode, Fragile Balance. Here, the role of the Colonel is essentially recast. Actor Michael Welch plays a teenage version of Jack. Young Jack is taken into custody when he tries to access Stargate Command, and despite Welch's dead-on impression, his friends take a bit of convincing that he really is who he says he is. Eventually, SG-1 discovers that this isn't their Colonel after all. He's a clone of Jack engineered by the Asgard Loki, who didn't end up fully mature because the Asgard had put a protective lock on O'Neill's DNA to prevent manipulation. It's an entertaining Jack story that gave Richard Dean Anderson the episode off. But he did return at the end to meet his double face to face, 
sending young Jack off to live a life of his own. Number 8. Observation Room Season 7, Episode 6 SG-1 boards a crashed alien ship and finds the survivors of the Talthans in stasis. The ship was ferrying refugees from their doomed planet to the new Talthan homeworld, but now the ship has crashed and the power is failing. A desperate engineer downloads a dozen mines from the ship's systems into Daniel's head in an effort to save them. What follows in the episode Lifeboat is an acting tour de force for Michael Shanks, along with Terrell Rothery putting in one of her best performances as Dr. Janet Frazier. And where is Colonel O'Neill during this trial? After he gets a clean bill of health, he parks himself in the observation room, ostensibly there to support his friend, though he ends up off-screen for most of the episode. As one personality after another emerges and takes control of Daniel, the scenes frequently cut to Jack watching it all unfold, though of course these were not shot contemporaneously, Anderson was able to film his role in a short window of time. Jack is then brought back in for the resolution at the end of the episode. Number 7, Una's Attack, Season 7, Episode 7. In Enemy Mine, Stargate Command runs afoul of a tribe of Unas while attempting to mine for Naquita on their sacred grounds. Although SG-1 is called in to evaluate the situation, it's Colonel Edwards, played here by Guardians of the Galaxy's Michael Rooker, who is in command of the operation. Soon Jack is injured in an Unas attack, and he's out for the rest of the episode. Pretty much everything you remember about this episode comes after Jack is sent to the infirmary. Daniel calls on his old Unas friend Chaka to help mediate the dispute, and after showing deference and respect to the Unas leader, they broker a treaty. Because they share a common enemy in the Goa'uld, the Unas are going to help mine Naquita for us. Number 6. Carter's Side Projects Season 7, Episodes 8 and 9 When the Serakan pilot Warwick shows up asking for the team's help to win a space race, Major Carter is more than up for the challenge. While she and Warwick enter Hebridan's dangerous loop of Khan Garat, Space Race sees the rest of SG-1 getting into trouble on the planet Hebridan. Teal'c and Warwick's brother Eamon get the B-plot, captured while trying to expose sabotage and corruption inside the company that sponsors the race. Meanwhile, Jack and Daniel are off doing their own thing for most of the episode, only turning up in time to see the bad guys get their just desserts. Then there is the next episode, Avenger 2.0, which also follows Carter for the main storyline. Sam tries to help SGC scientist Jay Felger avoid getting fired by finishing and deploying his Avenger computer virus. The program is meant to completely disable a target DHD, taking its Stargate offline. But when Ball gets his hands on the program, he modifies it, resulting in the failure of the entire Stargate network. Colonel O'Neill and Teal'c spend most of this episode off-world negotiating with Rebel Jaffa leaders. And while they do check in occasionally by radio, it again allowed Richard Dean Anderson to film all of his scenes in just a day or two. Number 5. A Jaffa Thing Season 7, Episode 10 It's easy to miss the fact that Jack steps out of Season 7's birthright halfway through. This one is a Teal'c episode through and through, as the team encounters a group of all-female rebel Jaffa led by Ishta, played by Star Trek's Jolene Blaylock. When she meets the team, Ishta more or less ignores O'Neill and addresses Teal'c instead. Rather than killing their fellow Jaffa to acquire symbiotes for their young girls, Teal'c tries to convince the Hak Teal that the drug Tritonin will free them from dependence on the Goa'uld. It's an emotional and important episode for Christopher Judge's character, at this point, Teal'c has only recently started taking Tritonin himself, and he must prove to Ishta that he's not less of a Jaffa because of it. The Hawk Teal agree to send four warriors to Earth for a drug trial, but tragically one of them does not survive. From the point that the Hawk Teal arrive on Earth, Jack is off doing something else until the farewell scene at the Stargate. Number 4. Not a Diplomat Season 7, Episode 14 Former SG-1 team member Jonas Quinn makes his grand return in Fallout, with a story from former cast member Corin Nemec. The planet Langara is at imminent risk of catastrophe, as the Colonnans' recent detonation of a Nequadria bomb has begun transforming a deep vein of Naquita into the highly volatile variant. Basically, the whole continent is about to explode. 
Sam and Teal'c join Jonas and his colleague and secret Goa'uld girlfriend, Kiana, in a massive excavator to try and cut off the Nequadria and save the planet. So where is Colonel O'Neill while his team is saving yet another planet? Back on Earth, Jack doesn't have a ton of patience for the petty squabbling of the delegates from Langara's three rival nations. When they balk at efforts to unify their people and resettle on another planet, Jack decides to bail. He puts Daniel in charge of the negotiations and leaves the base. It's a somewhat uncharacteristic choice for the show. Here, Jack doesn't have some sly plan up his sleeves to get the delegates to cooperate, and he apparently doesn't have to explain himself to General Hammond. He just throws up his hands and walks away, apparently unconcerned whether or not the Langarans are ultimately going to survive. Jack later returns near the end of the episode to deliver some bad news to the delegates. The deal's off. Their resettlement is no longer an option. That's what you get for dicking around. Number 3. Injured in the Line of Duty. Season 7, Episode 19. Colonel O'Neill is hit by a staff weapon blast square in the torso during an off-world firefight, seen in the episode Heroes Part 2. While the SGC's new ceramic armor plate saves his life, he gets some well-earned R&R to recover from his close brush with death. The episode that follows is Resurrection, written by Michael Shanks and directed by Amanda Tapping. Like Nightwalkers back in Season 6, this is one of those rare episodes that Richard Dean Anderson doesn't appear in at all. Sam tells Agent Barrett at the top of the episode that the Colonel is taking some time off, and that's the last we hear of it. Then, the next episode is Inauguration, a clip show where the newly elected President Henry Hayes is debriefed on the Stargate program. Aside from the flashbacks, SG-1 isn't in this one at all. Number 2. Frozen in Carbonite Season 8, Episode 1 Yes, yes, we know this is not actually Carbonite. The seventh season of SG-1 ends with a heartbreaking cliffhanger. After sacrificing himself to obtain the knowledge of the Ancients and saving Earth from Anubis' fleet, Jack is left near death. His only hope is a stasis chamber left behind by the Ancients, deep beneath the ice of Antarctica. There he is frozen, and with the Ancients' database still in his head, the team knows that unless they can get help from the Asgard, they had better not revive him. This leaves Colonel O'Neill completely out of the first hour of Season 8's two-part premiere, New Order and it meant that Anderson got an extra week off before reporting to Vancouver for the start of what would be his final season. Sam and Teal'c finally convinced the base's new commander to let them take their modified cargo ship to find the Asgard. But it's only in the second hour that Thor comes to Earth, beams up Jack, interfaces his mind with the ship's computer to build an anti-replicator weapon, and revives him to start a new season of adventures. Number 1. Brigadier General Season 8. When Stargate SG-1 was renewed for yet another season, it was not a certainty that Anderson would come back at all. But the writers had one more ace up their sleeve. Their leading man would return for one final year as a member of the main cast, but again with a filming schedule that was reduced even further to accommodate his family priorities. So how do you keep the character on the show, but not send him off-world with the team every week? How do you avoid another year of sticking Jack in the infirmary with an injury, or sending him fishing during tense negotiations, or tucking him into a broom closet when Kinsey comes to visit, but instead give him a permanent reason to have less screen time? Promote him, of course. Jack is promoted to Brigadier General at the end of the two-part season premiere. Commanding Stargate operations at the SGC is his new reality for the rest of the season. This new position makes for some intriguing and sometimes awkward growth for the character of Jack O'Neill, who is reluctant to take the job and sometimes seems like a fish out of water in that big chair. Jack becomes the decision maker and quipper in chief, while the also promoted Lieutenant Colonel Carter now leads SG-1. Some of these early episodes focus on Jack to remind the audience that he is still present, particularly episodes three and four, Lockdown and Zero Hour, but for the majority of the season, Jack's appearances are relegated to the conference room and the occasional check-in with the team. At this point, Jack had more than earned his retirement, but as Richard Dean Anderson departed the show, the writers sent O'Neill to Washington to head up the newly formed division of Homeworld Command, leaving the door open for many guest appearances still to come. 
Which of these ideas to keep Jack O'Neill around, but write him out of the main action, do you think was the most brilliant? What did you think of the Colonel's role in seasons 6, 7, and 8? Post your thoughts in the comments below. Visit us at GateWorld.net to explore more about these episodes and the character of Jack O'Neill, and subscribe to the channel now to make sure you see all the latest videos from GateWorld. Thanks so much for watching.